Hello, Haskell Love. It's so nice to uh, to see you all again, or uh, hear you all again, or see you on Discord. The um, I remember there was a time when I knew every Haskell programmer on the planet. You know, all four of them. But now there are many that I have never met, never had the honor to meet, but many of you are here and I love you all. I think Haskell Love is a great name for the conference because I think the community is characterized a lot by, you know, goodwill and humility and mutual respect and love. And I really, I really like that. Um, I'm very proud of it, actually, as a as a community. Um, so um, this talk is. Um, uh, is about a little um, data structure. I've had the tries of a data structure that kind of everyone knows about, but are not they're not so widely used in functional programming. I think not as widely used as they should be. So you think of it in the nature of a little tutorial. This isn't really a research talk at all. So I've sort of subtitled it to Programming Pearl. Um, and I wrote it in uh, co collaboration with my um, friends, uh, Sebastian Graf and Richard Eisenberg. So please um, uh, follow along. And um, I'm going to show you quite a bit of code. Please do. Um, uh, write questions in Discord. I've got Discord in a window just beside the one so I can see what you write and I'll, I'd much rather have some kind of dialogue conversation with you as you go along rather than save it all to the end. Um, so please do that. Okay, so um, we know all about finite maps. We have containers that map uh, keys to values and we use them a lot, a lot. Um, but sometimes you want keys that are, have more structure than just an integer or a string. So here's an example. Inside GHC, we have a very simple common sub-expression elimination pass. Um, and it works like this. When you see a let with another let nested inside it, uh, so here we get the let for x and the let for y, the, the y's right-hand side is the same as x's. So really, we can just replace that a plus b in the right-hand side of x with the um, uh, right-hand side of y's binding with x. Um, as I show on this slide. So to do that, we want to carry inwards as we walk over the expression, we want to carry inwards a finite mapping that maps expressions to variables. So in this case, we'd map a plus b to x. And then when we walk inwards and we see the, the y binding, we'd look, we'd look up the look up the right hand side, the entire right hand side in the map and say, oh, I've got that. It's just x. Um, so, an ex you know, this expert type is going to be some kind of algebraic data type representing the syntax tree of expressions. Here I've got a simple one, variables, applications, and lambdas. Well, we've seen that before quite a few times. Um, but, uh, but the point is that it's a data structure, not just a string. Um, so, of course, you can do a finite mapping like this using containers. You've just got to um, provide an ORD instance for, um, uh, for expressions, and away you go. But um, that's not really terribly efficient because at every node of this binary tree inside, you know, a, one of these finite maps in, in built by containers, it's going to be some kind of binary tree. And it's going to, um, at every node of the tree, we're going to compare the expression we're looking up with an expression stored at the binary tree, sort of walk over them and compare them. And then we'll, the next node will walk over and compare again. And of course, we'll probably get, um, you know, a less than or greater than before going too deep. But still, it doesn't smell like the right thing to do. Um, somehow, um, we, uh, we ought to be able to look up an expression with a single traversal, traversal over the expression tree that we're looking up. Um, here's another example of the same kind of thing, which also happens inside GHC. So imagine in your Haskell program, you've got these instance declarations for class C, uh, C of tree A and maybe B, and instance of tr C of tree A and int. Well, then, and then supposing we want to look up, so GHC is faced with trying to solve the constraint C of tree list of int and maybe bool, then it has to look up each of the instances it's got to see if it's um, uh, which match it, that is, which is a substitution instance of it, right? So in this case, the, um, the first of these two instances is a match by mapping A to list of int and B to bool. Um, so here using, um, you know, containers doesn't work at all, right? Because we can't put in C tree of A, maybe B, as you know, insert that into the tree and then look up C tree list of in maybe bull. This wouldn't work at all. So, you know, the, our, our story for existing containers doesn't work at all. So, presently, what GHC does, actually does today, is it does a linear search down the instances for the class C, looking one at a time, each time matching against the, we take the, the thing we're looking up and we match it against the instance that we stored. That doesn't match. So, we try the next one, then we try the next one, and so forth. If there are a lot of instances, like thousands of them, then that's not very cool, right? It's kind of slow, and um, you'd sort of ex you wouldn't expect it to be so slow. Somehow you'd expect to be able to look up even thousands of instances by sort of walking down a tree and and uh, in the kind of log end time that you might expect. Um, moreover, 
I've spoken about matching, but in fact, there is a little complication in GHC, which is that really we want to know which instances unify, not just which ones match, something I'll come back to at the end. So um, that's one example when we want to do something with an expression or something like an expression as a key, but that isn't just an ordinary finite map. It's a sort of finite map that involves matching. Here is another one also inside GHC. Um, you, many of you will know that you can write rewrite rules um, in GHC, in which you write a, um, in this funny rules pragma, you write a left-hand side and a right-hand side with the idea that any time GHC comes across an example of the left-hand side in the program you are compiling, it's going to rewrite it to the right-hand side. You'd better be right that these two um, expressions are equivalent um, in, um, um, in form, uh, in, in, in um, uh, what's the word, semantics, but there you go, that's what um, GHC will do. Um, now, uh, again, um, JT currently is just doing a linear search um, through the rules, um, one at a time. Um, and that's not good if there are lots of rules. So in two different ways, we're doing this sort of matching lookup. Jer I'm already, um, uh, Jeremy's already telling me he's given a similar talk at BobConf. So now I've got to go and see this. I'm going to use Haskell as well. Um, uh, it'll be very interesting. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, oh, yes. And one um, that... Devanorama says adding hash code to every node may speed up order a lot. It may indeed, yes. So uh, yes, do, having a, um, a you know may, maybe hashing expressions would work well. It gets a lot trickier when you have binders involved, and there's another talk about that um, hashing of expressions with binders. Um, a little bit trickier anyway, but it's, it's a perfectly decent suggestion. Yes, um, but it, it, again, it doesn't work very well for matching, right? When you want this matching game, then hashing isn't going to work at all. Okay. So what we really want is some kind of, for this matching business, is a data structure where we can look up not just key value bindings, but pattern value bindings. And a lookup should return any matches, maybe zero, maybe one, maybe many matches, where the pattern that you inserted into the data structure matches the target that you're looking up. Um, oh, uh, right. And you also want to return the matching substitution, right? Now, it turns out that having done the work, we sort of implemented all this, discovered uh, some, 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 somewhat subsequently, though this isn't well known in the, in the functional programming community, the automated reasoning community has been doing this for 30 years. And there are lots of papers about this problem, which turned out to have, you know, it, it, it turned out to be very nicely complementary, actually. Um, and you can see our paper for discussion of this related work. But I just want to mention, in case anybody knows, there is a, um, uh, there's a lot of related work here that we didn't know about when we started. That's the advantage of writing a paper. You get to find things out. So um, here is uh, the standard way that you would tackle a problem like this. Right? Let's, let's just go back, not to the, the matching process, but the straightforward lookup process that we use for the common sub-expression elimination thing that I described. Um, it's to use a try. So, and the idea is when you've got a big key, you look it up a little bit at a time. So if the key is a string, we'll look up the first character and then the second and then the third and so forth. Um, and there's a little diagram on the right that I just stole completely from Wikipedia, right? So at the root of the tree, oh, this is a, a try containing the keys, you know, it says at the bottom, A, 2, T, Ted, 10 and so forth. And at the top, we look up the first character if it's a T, we go down the branch to the T, and then we, we look up the second character, which can be an O or an E. Those are the only two words that begin with T that are in this particular finite map, and then we rapidly find our way to the, the right answer. I hope, I hope this is a pretty simple looking data structure to do. So this worked well for strings, right? Just look them up a bit at a time. And there's a tremendous amount of related work on this, of course. And for a long time, it's been well known how to extend the same idea to a key that is a data structure. This goes back to at least 1993, um, with this is Lockwood Morris, who is really a, you know, a, a um, established academic when I was just uh, coming out of graduate school. Um, so um, we can uh, adapt this idea to, um, to data structures straightforwardly. And it, it is, so I'm telling you nothing new here, um, but, I, but it's surprisingly not well known. I didn't know it well, certainly maybe you all do, but I doubt it. Um, so here's the idea. We're going to, um, uh, I'm, and so this is how it renders into Haskell. So if we have a data type expert that, um, um, that is uh, just, let's just take variables and applications for the moment. Um, and let's just take, let's say a variable is just a string, just to be concrete about this, right? Then the data structure that, we, they, that we're going to represent these finite maps in, these tries, I'll call an extra map. So this is an extra map with values of type V whose keys are experts. 
And it's just going to be a pair. It's built with this constructor EM, and it is a case for the variable case, for a case for the var constructor, and a case for the app constructor. So um, if the expression you're looking up is just the var, well, you look in the EM var field. And there you will find a mapping from, well, since the expression you're looking up is a variable, all that is left is to say, well, which variable is it? So all we need is a, an ordinary old data dot map, finite map from var to the value v. But what if the expression you're looking up is an application? Well, then um, we want to look up the left hand expression um, uh, in an expo map. So let's have an expo map of something. So in that outer expo map, we're going to look up the, um, uh, the left hand expression. And what do we get back? Oh, not a value, but another expo map in which we can look up the right hand expression. So um, in effect, the first lookup tells you, um, uh, you know, keys on the first expressions and gives you a finite mapping of all those applications whose first expression is that the thing you, you looked up. I hope that's, that's clear. So this nested expo map idea um, is the sort of the, the main, uh, once you get used to it, it's very natural and easy. But to begin with, it sort of does your head in. And um, so don't worry if it does, It'll, we'll see a lot more of it. But um, I think maybe one way to make it concrete would be to show you a bit about what lookup would look like. Um, so here's some, uh, here's, uh, here's lookup. So what, what does lookup do? It takes an expression, an expo map, and returns a maybe v. How does it work? Well, um, we look at the expression where, try, I'll call it the target expression. Here I've written it as e. And I'll look up e and say, is, is it a var? If it's a var, then I'll just look up in the m var map, which is an ordinary data dot map map, I'll just look up x in it, and that's going to give me a maybe result, and we're good. right? Um, and for applications, what am I going to do? I'm going to look up e1 in the um, this nested expo map that we had in the em map field. And if I get nothing, well, then there are no expressions that start with the left-hand expression, so I can return nothing. Um, definitely, there's no expressions that have their full application. But if I find at least some expressions that have an application of the, you know, E1 to something, then I'm going to look up E2 in the map I get back. Yeah. Um, and I think Morrow is right. This does feel a bit like currying, doesn't it? Um, you sort of, it's rather like a function that returns a new function. Here you've got a map that returns a new map. Um, this is very... Uh, um, uh, very much has the same flavor. So I hope that everybody's um, comfortable with that. So type a question into um, Discord if, you, if you're lost at this stage. Um, so there is Christian, a question. Yeah, Christian asks, what happens if you use the argument of the application? The argument of the application is the first key. Better or work lookup insertion performance? Actually, Christian, I think that probably is a bit um, sort of application dependent. It depends sort of you, what you want to do is to fail as quickly as possible if it's not there. Um, and so... Um, uh, so it, it probably depends on what sort of expressions you have. My instinct is that you, usually the, the thing to do is to go around and find the function fairly quickly, right? So go down looking at the left-hand uh, left branch as much as you can. Um, but I thought it would be subject to measurement. I don't think there's a principled answer to that. Different applications might be different. Um, Jeremy says, it's exactly currying. And I was hoping you'd say something like that, Jer Jeremy. So maybe in the special chat later, you can give us a, you know, an epimorphism that will tell us exactly why it's like currying. Okay. Um, right. Um, I would call on you to note that just in this lookup thing, that we never compare two expressions and that the target expression, in this case E, is only traversed once, exactly once. We simply walk down it. Um, we never look at anything twice. And I think it's a really nice property um, to have. Um, the other thing to note is that already this program is just a little bit remarkable. Um, in that it requires polymorphic recursion. It was kind of hidden, but it was there because when we, um, that recursive call to look up expert on the same line of the app constructor here is calling look up expert at a different type than the type of, of the, uh, the function I'm defining. Or another way to say it is the two calls to look up expert in the body are at different types. Um, so, um, in fact, not all languages allow this. Haskell has allowed polymorphic recursion for a very long time. Um, but, uh, but not all languages do. So the fact this kind of quotes just works without these type applications, by the way, is um, just fine. Um, 
Uh, Stephanie, yes, this reminds me of one of my favorite papers by Ralph Hinzer. And indeed, um, Ralph has, uh, uh, has a paper called Generalized, Generalizing Generalized Tries, which I'll refer to later. Um, now, uh, let me remark also, I, I, the sense I want to get to, to get across to you is that there's something kind of very simple and elegant about this idea. So I'm hoping that it may be something that would resonate for you could use in other applications. Here, for example, is how, how beautiful union is. Union is when you want to take two expo maps and union them to make a um, you know, map that combines all the, all the key value bindings in both of them. And it could be simpler, right? It's, um, it's basically just a zip because if you take the EM var fields of the two, well, um, both of them, you just, you just got to take the union in the data dot map sense union of the two um, M var fields. The app field is a little, that's not so obvious. How do I take the union of the two? Um, well, I've sort of somehow got to recursively call X per map, but I don't want to, I don't want to make one override the other. Here I want M, M var two and, oh, so beg your pardon, M app one and M app two are two expo maps and I want to union them, but their elements are expo maps. So I may well have the same key in both mapp1 and mapp2, and I've got to combine their values with what? Well, with union expo. So I need to generalize this to union with, right? This is totally standard from, um, uh, from uh, uh, um, you know, the containers library, um, as well as having union, it has union with. And what does union with do? It takes two expo map Vs, but you give it a V to V to V function to use when combining two maps that have the same, where the, where the keys clash, right? Then you use this combining function to combine the two Vs. So now we can write EMAP as a, as a union with expo and a nested union with expo for that, that F. It's really very simple and beautiful. Just a zip on these, um, these two uh, data structures. Um, and you'll notice that this is really different than what would happen if you were having somehow, you know, AVL trees or red black trees or something. When if you take the union of two maps, they might be balanced in two completely different ways. So there's quite a lot more work to do. Here it's just a straight zip. Um, very simple. Very simple. Now, uh, let's see. Any other um, questions? Uh, let's see. Remark from Jeremy. Thank you. Um, wonder if encoding expert trees as depth first traversal path would make the user tree app. Yes, Divanorama, in a sense, um, in a very real sense, actually, you could say just take the original tree and serialize it into a sort of sequence of, you know, tokens, depth first, and then use old, uh, you know, all traditional tries. In effect, that's what we're doing, but we're fusing it with the, um, uh, we're fusing that operation with the, um, the, the serialization step. But that's a very good intuition. Yes. Um, now, um, uh, empty. Oh, yes. So uh, um, Joachim is talking, already talking about what happens for the empty map. Good question. Have I? Yes. Very good. The next slide. Um, uh, now, uh, sorry, but let's just sticking with union for a moment. Jeremy says, union is like a long zip on this rather than the standard short zip where the length of the result is the length of the longer argument. Yes. So we definitely need to, we mustn't throw anything away. So. Uh, normal, just straight zip, Haskell zip on lists discards the longer, the, the tail of the longer list. We don't want to do that. We really are keeping, keep, keeping, um, uh, you know, zipping the two together, keeping everything, hence the union with. Now, what are we to do for empty? Um, and uh, indeed, um, Joachim has it. What are we to say for an empty map? Well, um, um, we might hope to, for, for the EM var thing, it's fine. We can just have map.empty, but what for the EM app? Well, it's pretty pretty obvious, really. We need an expo map, and we have one, namely empty expo map. Um, so that's quite cool. This is, well, the empty expo map is an infinite data structure. Um, that's kind of cute. It's a cute, you know, it makes Haskell people sort of, you know, go all glassy eyed and feel pleased with themselves. <laughs> but actually, it doesn't really work very well when you want to have folds, right? If you want to say, how big is this XMOM? How many key value bindings does it have? Well, then, that's, you know, that's a, that's a special case of a fold. Then you don't want an infinite data structure, because you keep looking down the EM map to say, and how big are you? And then he says, oh, I'm an EM and I have an EM app. You look, how big are you? And you just keep going forever. That would not be cool. So in fact, we do really need um, an empty data constructor in this representation. Um, so here's the way we're really going to do um, 
uh, expert maps. And now we can write a, a fully general fold. I'm not going to give the code um, for this, um, but it's. Um, uh, but fold, I think yeah, I think it would be a simple exercise to write fold at this point. Um, there's also um, uh, there's also in the paper you'll find a stuff about singleton maps that I'm not going to cover yet because I want to. Um, uh, it's a you know in the context of a conference talk I want to keep keep going. I want to get to sort of get to matching. So uh, let me look at Discord. Um, uh, oh yes, um, this all looks right. I think that's fine. The Matten says, looks like it going from co-product to product in the case of Expoma. Yes, yes, right. Let me come back to that when I talk about generics in a second. Let's just talk about binders first. So what happens if we want to have a, um, oh, well, maybe I can start with, look, look, the pattern here is, as, as the Matten points out, um, that for every data constructor in Expo, we have a field in Expo map. And for every field, in the original data structure that is expert here, we have a sort of nested construction in the, or coed constructions, um, Jeremy might say, in the expo map. So it seems like a fairly a ritualized kind of um, transformation, and indeed it is. So if I add lambdas, would this be cool? Um, so uh, here it is, uh, somebody type in, um, in the Discord, is this cool for lambdas? I've just replicated the very same structure. Lam has two arguments, var and expo. So I have a map from var to a nested expo map. Is that good? Ah. In a real room, I could see you and make eye contact. Here, I can't. What's going to go wrong here? I'll give you a clue. It's not good. Uh, maybe it's just the act of typing takes too long. Uh, here. So uh, look, if I insert lambda x dot x and look up lambda y dot y, I sort of hope to get a hit, wouldn't I? Because those are the same lambda term, really. Um, but if I have a uh, if the em lam thing has a mapping from variables to expo maps, right? Um, then in the first one, I'm going to insert, and then I have a mapping from x, the string x, to all the things, all the lambda terms who, that go lambda x dot body. But and then I'll look up, um, and, I'll, and when I'm looking up lambda y, I'll look up that y string and say, oh, there are none that start lambda y. That would be completely wrong. Um, so yes, it's not good. We need to look up somehow modulo alpha equivalence. So what are we going to do? Well, we can just use a standard hammer, right? Uh, every time this happens in the, you know, in the world of um, uh, compiler design and lambda calculus and reasoning about programs, we use De Bruyne uh, a lot, right? So um, in effect, we want to rename the key to what, what's called locally nameless forms. Um, so what does locally nameless means? It means that variables that are bound by a, you know, a, a lambda that's part of this particular term get replaced by their De Bruyne number, which is the number of, uh, if I imagine numbering the lambdas from outside inwards, that's one way to do it. Let's imagine numbering them from outside inwards. The first lambda is lambda one, the second lambda is number two and so forth. So, and then I'm going to replace the, the X, which is a bound variable from the, uh, the that lambda x. I'll place it with um, some new uh, symbol in a hash here. I've used to say this is an occurrence of a bound variable and it's um, uh, De Bruyne index. But the y being free, I'll leave alone. But I may want to look up, um, uh, I, I, my, my, right on slide one, I had x equals a plus b. That a and the, that a plus b, those were completely free variables in the term. They're fine. We want to treat them as constants. OK, so I hope this is. Um, uh, I hope this is okay. Just imagine, imagine in your head then, first of all, converting the, the expression, the key to a De Bruyne numbered form and then sticking it in the map. So as ima well, imagine in your head that I had a data type expert prime with had a, ba a two constructors. Instead of one constructor for vars, it had two, one for bound variables with a De Bruyne index inside it and one for free variables with the old var inside it. And then it had applications. And lambdas, you note, now do not have a var field because lambdas are simply implicitly numbered by their index from counting from the, out the outside. Okay, so I hope that that so this is only going to be a thought experiment, but it's a very useful thought experiment because it means we can apply the 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 same um, idiom to say, OK, four constructors, four fields. Bound var has a single field that's an int, so I'll use a data dot map 
um, on int for that. Uh, free var has a single um, uh, field called var, and I can, that's just a string. I use a, a um, data.map for that. Um, applications we talked about, and lambdas, oh, they have just one field, which is an exponent. I just have a recursive exponent map. So there's no nesting there, because it only has one field. I hope that makes sense. OK. Um, so, uh, but we don't actually need to, to do this um, conversion to expert prime on the, uh, you know, in advance. We don't need to, as it were, take a pass and then insert it. We can just fuse those two. And indeed, it's quite easy to do the fusion in your head, in which case you get code that looks somewhat like this. This is the, probably the, uh, the most code you'll see on any one slide. So, um, uh, so here, lookup is got the, you know, the full lookup is going to take an expo and an expo map to be sure, but it also take this bound variable map, BV map. Um, and what is a BV map? Well, it's a pair of an integer that meant that indicates that is the next unused De Bruyne index, as it were, we, as we pass lambdas, we're going to increment this to say which, la which number to use for the next lambda. And we're also going to then carry a mapping from variables, the bound variables, bound by outer lambdas, to their De Bruyne indices. So, um, so now what happens? Well, let's see. When I come across, when I look up E, I've got, I'm looking up scrutiny, so I've got a case E, and then I look, I look up the app case. Oh, blimey. Um, look up the, in the app case, it's exactly like before, no change. For the var case, I need to first of all say, well, this variable, um, is it a bound variable or a free variable? How do I find that out? Ah, I look it up in the BV map, in the bound variable map. Very good. If I get a hit, well, then it must have been a bound variable, and I look that up. I look up its De Bruyne index, N, in the, the, um, the BVAR field of the um, expo map. If it is not in the bound variable map, it must be a free variable. And I look it up in the free variable field of the um, uh, expo map. Simple enough, I hope. For lambdas, what do I do? Well, um, I'm just going to recursively call lookup expo on the same on the on the body that is E um, uh, and the the, the EM lamb field, which contains the the finite map. Oh dear, there's a bug in this slide. There should be an EM lamb field for this. EM thing as there was. There can't be. I got. I somehow have app bvar f. Oh, this is completely bogus. Um, sorry. The that top EM var should be an EM lamb. I beg his pardon. So that's the the green part is wrong. Uh, the yellow part here is correct. Um, very good. Uh, what have I got to do? Oh, all I have to do at a lambda is to. Um, extend the bound variable map. So I bump the um, the, the counter for uh, how many lambdas I've seen to next plus one and insert the bound variable x into the bound variable map and then recurse. Okay, so I hope this is um, quite uh, um, uh, quite straightforward. So um, uh, what I hope you to get uh, to, to get out of this is that um, this is a pretty simple and efficient thing to do. Um, and um, and it's not there's nothing very original or deep here. It's just using ordinary old De Bruyne numbers. But it's very satisfying when a standard well-known technique sort of just works and makes your life simpler. It just solves the problem, you know, at a blow. It's very, very nice. So there you go. Um, right. Let's pause for a moment and just stand back a bit and look at what the general pattern is. Um, now, um, somebody's already noticed there is a general pattern going on here of, uh, of um, sums turning into products and products turning into these nested coefficients. Um, but an annoying thing is that each data type needs a new trimap structure. I haven't really emphasized this. I've just stuck with expressions. But if I had declarations as well, then declarations would need a declaration trimap. Um, and they um, and types would need a type trimap and uh, uh, as well as expressions. So so for each for each um, data type, I have a new type of trimaps. That's not terribly nice, right? Um, so it's really more of a design pattern than a library, right? It's not like containers. This is more like a, a, a design pattern you can execute on. So it's an obvious um, place where you might say, couldn't we use some kind of generic or polytypic programming technique? And indeed, that is what Ralph's paper is about from 20 years ago, mind, um, uh, about. So, but since then, we've had, you know, there's, there's, there's various approaches to generic programs and, um, uh, you know, there's a GHC generics library and GenX SOP and all that. I have not tried to do um, uh, a, a sort of full on generics approach to doing the stuff I'm describing here. I think it would be an interesting thing to try. I think the, um, the nested data type might be a problem, maybe not. 
Um, and I think the binders um, probably will be a problem, as in, you know, what's happening for um, uh, for lambdas here really isn't generic. Right? You can only know that you've got to do something different for lamb, lamb var expert. It could be that really is a pair of an occurrence of a variable. We know that it's a binder, but, you know, a generics library might not. So I don't. I think there'd be, I have not done this. I'm throwing this out as a, you know, um, this is a, you know, uh, audience full of uh, Haskell experts, people who are really good at programming Haskell. Uh, give it a go. Um, maybe there's a template Haskell. I mean, uh, you could surely solve this with template Haskell too. Um, and I've not done that, that either. Um, but it'd be, it'll be sort of, you know, brutal. Uh, so at the moment, I, I'm a sort of, you know, uh, 19th century programmer, I just write it out by hand. And you'll see in JHC source code, um, a, a written out by hand version of trimax for expressions and for types. Okay, here we are at half, half um, past. Uh, um, Stephanie, can you may elaborate on, hmm. Uh, let me see, Chris, could a technique like this be used for binding variables in pattern matching by zipping a value with a binding expression? Chris, I think you'll have to say a bit more or talk in the special chat later to, add in sound ways what you mean here. Um, uh, the Matan says such a generic library presumably involves some sort of matching functions and input. Well, actually, I hadn't got to matching at all yet. I think even to do um, uh, a library that, you know, a generic stuff that dealt with this finite mapping business with no matching involved, because I haven't shown you anything about matching yet, all that, all by itself, that would be, that's a, you know, that's something of a challenge. Um, you know, it's the challenge that Ralph Hinzer addressed. Um, but uh, I haven't tried, tried to apply that in GHG genomics. You know, so when we get to matching, then it'll get yet harder. Yeah, and that's what I want to talk about now. So I'm going to talk about go back to matching now, but not talking about generic programming at all, just for expert um, and a, a essentially design pattern you can use for any type. So um, just a reminder then, um, the problem that we're now seeking to do is to make a data structure into which you can insert insert pattern value pairs and then look up targets to see if they match the pattern. So for these instant activations, the patterns are something like, um, you know, C tree A, maybe B. And then I want to look up things like C tree list event, maybe bull. Right? Um, right, that's our goal. That's the goal. Uh, now, um, I think a helpful way to think of this is to think in a, in a sort of denotational terms. So really, this has been implicit in everything I've been talking. An expo map denotes, stands for, a set of expo value pairs, right? I've talked about it as a set of key value bindings, right? So it's just a set. And lookup means find the EV pair in the set. When I'm looking up a target T, find the EV pair in the set where E equals T, if there is one, and tell me if there is. That's what lookup means. Now, the point about the data structure is you want to do that efficiently, but morally in denotational terms, it's just a set of expression value pairs. Now, for matching, you know, M expo maps, expo maps that do matching, um, here I want to, to denote a set of pattern value pairs, sort of expo pattern value pairs, whatever that might mean. And now lookup is going to mean find all the set of pattern value pairs in the set where the pattern P matches the target. Um, and I mean, find all the pattern values, because there might be more than one that matches, right? Or maybe none. Um, and, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, each of these matches should preferably return the matching substitution, right? Because if I've got one of these rules, or, or like, uh, let's say those rewrite rules, remember when I match the left-hand side, I want to use the matching substitution to instantiate the right-hand side. So I really want to have the matching substitution back as well. Okay. Now, um, so it means that my lookup function is going to have a signature more like this, right? It takes an expression on one of these MX for maps and returns a bag that is zero or more results. Um, and um, uh, and it, a bag of what? A bag of pairs of what? Values V. And then this list of var expo pairs is meant to be the matching substitution. You've got maybe that, maybe that could be a finite map. I've just written a, an association list here. But that's the sort of signature we want for lookup. So plainly, you know, things are going to get a bit more interesting here. All right. Um, now, uh, let's see. Um, now we have to answer what is an, um, what does one of these patterns look like? Well, presumably one of these patterns, which I've only talked about informally so far, is really two things a list of pattern variables or a set of pattern variables, 
and an expo that mentions some of those variables, right? So there'll be occurrences of the pattern variables. So in the in this instance declaration I gave you, the pattern variables are A and B. They're, as it were, the quantified variables of the, of the match, uh, but I'll call them the pattern variables. And then the pattern itself is C of tree A, maybe B, right? So, um, so this pair is what I'll call A, um, a pattern. Now, um, uh, now immediately we have immediately we've identified patterns in this way. We've got to worry about the very similar problem that we had with lambdas, namely sort of accidental collisions, um, or, or I mean, beg your pardon, sort of something something very akin to the alpha equivalent equivalence problem. So here are two pattern value pairs. So the bit in orange here is meant to be the pattern, and the value is the second element of the pair. So I want to imagine a you know one of these matching expo maps that contains these two uh, pattern value bindings. Now, so the first has pattern variables A and B, the second has pattern variables X and Y. Um, and, um, uh, but it ha happens that, that, so they're not the same, right? They, one goes F, A, B, true, the other goes F, Y, X, false. Um, but we don't really want the accidental naming of pattern variables to um, put us off. It's not going to make us give the wrong answers, but it's going to turn out if we, if we treat each pattern variable as being a sort of distinct thing that we actually look up. So we look up A somewhere, we look up Y somewhere, and they're not the same. So we go down a different branch. Then we don't get nearly as much sharing in our lookup as we would um, if, we, if we did sort of canonicalize in some way, like we did from De Bruyne. So I'll leave you to just work out what I mean by destroy the sharing. We could talk about it afterwards if you want to elaborate on that. But I hope there's some, uh, there's some sort of reason in principle also for saying that the names that we choose for the um, for the pattern variables shouldn't really matter, right? So um, so it makes sense to think maybe we should canonicalize them just as we did. What was De Bruyne numbering? It was simply canonicalizing the accidentally varying lambda binders to have a canonical single form so they look more like each other. So let's do the same for the pattern variables. So maybe we should give each pattern variable a canonical name. So instead of, I've left the A and B, but imagine that A is called $1 and B is called $2, right? And that X is called $1 and Y is called $2. Now, um, you know, there's less variation. <laughs> the, the, these two terms, F of $1, $1, $2 and F $2, $1, $1, they look at least more like each other but they still don't look quite like each other because the order of the quantified variables, the pattern variables, really should not matter either. It's sort of accidental whether I said for all A, B, blah, 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 or for all B, A, blah, 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 isn't it? That would be, be silly if that really mattered, particularly, particularly silly if it affected performance. That would be horrible. So maybe we can canonicalize that away as well, like this. So um, maybe we could just say, Let's allocate the pattern key. So I'll call these numbers um, uh, $1, $2, and so forth. I'll call them pattern keys. They're very like De Bruyne indices. I won't call them De Bruyne indices because they're not. I'll just call them pattern keys. They're just numbers, canonical numbers that I'm going to use. Those, each, each of them is associated with one of the, the pattern variables. So, but now I'm going to choose the, um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the pattern keys by the order in which I first encounter an as yet unallocated pattern variable. So here, um, you know, my original um, uh, pattern was you know, FAB uh, back on this slide at the top, you see FAB. So in my left to right traversal, remember when I'm doing this lookup and insertion, there is an order that I'm doing it in that was bit baked into my lookup and insertion. That order, if you like the, you know, the, um, a, a, um, pre-order. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to say I encounter A first, so it'll be dollar one. I encounter B second, it'll be dollar two. In the second one, I encounter Y first, it'll be dollar one. I encounter X second, so it'll be dollar two. So now I get the um, now at the bottom of this slide, both of the orange um, sort of canonical patterns now look the same until I get to the true and the false bit. That's good, but I have to remember somehow what the mapping that goes back from pattern keys to pattern variables is, but in the end, I want a mapping from pattern variables to expressions, because that's what I need to use when the rule matches and I got to instantiate the right-hand side of the expression. Sorry, that was a long sentence, but I hope, it, I hope you see that it's okay for me to assign um, canonical 
uh, pattern variables in any order I pattern keys in any in any way I like. But I need to do to remember I need to remember how I did it. And so I'm suggesting doing that here by making my key value bindings now or pattern value bindings. Um, I'm going to put this little finite map the the sort of the the um, the pattern key substitution in the value that I look up. So when I get a hit, then I can say, oh, I got a hit. But here's how I can unscramble it. Right, so I encode it in a canonical way. When I get a hit, then I get a key, a, a, a sort of unscrambling um, substitution uh, pair with paired with the value. Okay, and then the final step is, oh, uh, Joachim says, why not canonicalize the right-hand side too and then throw away the variable names? That would be a cool idea, I think, Joachim, if you knew what the right hand side was. Right. So here I'm trying to write data structures that have, um, you know, where V, the values that I'm looking up are completely unknown to the to the library. I don't want to if I know that it's not just a, a mapping from if I know that it's a mapping from expressions to um, expressions, for example, then I could do what you describe. If it's expressions to, well, I don't know what something polymorphic, then I can't. Um, Right, uh, Artem asks, is something like pattern keys already in some parts of GHC? Oh, probably in 17 different parts. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot of this kind of thing goes on. Uh, right, so, but I want to take the final step because this, this is, you know, this, is, is, insofar as this paper has insights, this is that this little sequence is the sort of sequence of insights that I think gets you uh, to be able to un understand how the code works, which is to, to say the final step is since I'm numbering off these um, things, these uh, pattern keys in the order encountered, I don't even need to remember their number, just as the lambdas. When I did De Bruyne numbering, I don't put a number on the lambda because it's implicit by its position. Here, I don't need to put a number on the these um, uh, pattern variables because it's implicit by their position. So um, there is a uh, I hope somebody may may tell me why this is not quite right, but it's it's nearly right. Uh, I'm going to fix it in a second. But th that suggests that here we're going to want to add yet another form of variable to our extra prime, if you like. So we've still got the same idea where we're going to sort of canonicalize our key, but uh, our pattern before looking up. We're going to have this pat var thing. But it doesn't have a name, right? It doesn't, it's just a dollar. It's the thing that stands for dollar. So it doesn't have any arguments at all. Okay. Um, so now. The idea then is when we're going to insert a, a pattern that has a pattern variables and pattern and value pair, what we're going to do is we're first going to, as it were, rename the pattern to turn all those pattern variables into dollars to give a sort of pat prime, which is in this expert prime type, and then produce this pattern variable mapping, which maps from pattern keys back to pattern variables. And then we're going to actually insert the pair pattern prime mapping to the value, uh, the pattern variable map paired with the original value. Right. So now we need an expert map keyed by expert prime, and we know how to do that, right? We can apply the sort of standard plan for uh, uh, for a tri map keyed by expert prime. Um, and in fact, since PatVar has no arguments, it has a very easy um, way to match it. Um, it's very quick to match. Now, uh, because there's nothing further to match, if you hit a pattern variable. By definition, you're saying if it's if let's say they occur linearly for now, if you hit a pattern variable, then you get an Im immediate success. So we need a maybe to say either we get immediate success with a V or there wasn't a pattern variable at this point. So here's a little um, screw. Yes, uh, you're Kim, correct. We're only talking about linear patterns so far. That was what I was hoping somebody would say. Because what happens if you have repeated variables, right? This is the last technical bit of this talk, and we still have uh, 10 minutes to do this in. Good. So uh, if we have a repeated variable A, what are we going to do? Well, we, what, that, what does that mean? Well, we want to match. We, we only want to succeed if the um, both are, you know, the, we, we, we want to match something like C of tree int, maybe int, but not C of tree int, maybe bool, because then the, the A can't match with both int and bool. So what does this tell say about our canonicalization story? Well, um, I think what we want to do is to say the first occurrence in our left to right traversal is going to get um, canonicalized to um, uh, to dollar, right? That's just going to say that's the first occurrence of this um, pattern variable um, A or B. Then any subsequent get occurrences are going to get canonicalized to the index of that pattern variable. So in this particular example, I've got FBAA, 
Um, the first one I came across was B, that gets canonicalized to dollar one. The second one was A, that gets canonicalized to dollar two. So it turns into F of dollar, that's pat var, another dollar, that's another pat var, those were the B and the A. Then the dollar two says, and here is a here is a second occurrence of one of those patent variables, and it's um uh and it's A, and it's the, the dollar two. Okay. And we still need this patent variable to, to map. So now uh, just this is the sort of final, you know, uh, turn of the screw in our notional extra prime type, we need to have a sort of play, uh, a, a constructor for dollar, that is the pat var, the original binding occurrence, and a different constructor here, I've called it pat var x with an index that says which patent variable occurred. Okay. Um, so this is just a rendering into standard, uh, you know, good old, um, uh, you know, algebraic data types of the, you know, suggestive syntax that I was writing on this slide. Um, and then I can simply apply the very same handle again, right? So now I need yet another field here. I've called it EMX var for second and subsequent occurrences of a uh, pattern bound variable. Uh, and once again, you will be relieved to know that uh, you can do the fusion trick again, but I'm not going to inflict it upon you, right? So if you, you, we do not actually need to construct this expo prime thing. We can do it all on the fly by carrying an auxiliary bound var map for the lambdas and a different pattern key substitution threaded in a different way for the, because it has to be threaded in this sort of depth first traversal way for the, um, uh, the pattern variables, but it all, you know, it, it's once you've got clear in your head what you're trying to do, the actual amount of code is not very hard, but it is quite tricky to write. And it did my head in the first um, time I tried to write it. So um, that was part of the reason for writing the paper, thinking, oh, this is a bit less straightforward than I thought. So, hey, I should write a paper. And if it's, um, uh, it can be a modest paper, and that's what it is. So uh, let's see, what else to say about this? Um, so, uh, so that's it for matching. Right. So this stage, we have a tree that does matching. It doesn't do unification, but it does matching quite well, I think. Now, um, I want to say, um, I want to move towards wrapping up. Let me say a little bit about polymorphic types. Um, so the first thing to say is, I'm sure some of you will have been thinking, um, if we have a look up for expo maps and look up for you know decal maps and look up for these kind of maps, surely there, there must be a type class involved here. And surely there is, yes. So. Um, Try maps can be a, a type class with an empty lookup, an alter, a fold, and a union with, and so forth. Maybe maybe one or two more. It's a it's a type class with an associated type for here called try key for every for every um, try map like expo map. There's an associated key type in this case expo. Um, so this is quite useful, and it's particularly useful when you want to make try maps for polymorphic types like lists. So here I've written list out in its full glory, right? As a you know, no, we're not using special syntax. Now, so what would you expect to do if I just crank the handle uh, using the idiom that I've shown you already? Um, then you'd get well, what a field for each constructor. So a field for nil and a field for cons. For nil, there's no field, so I just get a maybe. That's straightforward. For cons, I'm going to have a, a nested invocation of list map of v for that um, the second argument. But for the first argument, I need to have an a map, as it were. Goodness, what is an a map? Uh, it's a polymorphic variable. If it, if I knew it was expo, I could say expo map. If I knew it was decal, I could say decal map. But for a, what am I going to do? Well, um, we of course, we just have to abstract over it. So my list map, I'm going to parameterize over the type of maps for, so here I just parameterized over TM, the, the try map for the, the, um, the argument field, in this case, for the cons. Now lookup list, if you imagine lookup list, what is lookup list going to do? It's going to take a list of things and look it up in a list map. But what is it a list of? And what is this TM thing? And can it really be that polymorphic? Well, Obviously not. Here is the type that we want, right? So the TM that's in list map must itself be a try map, right? That is, have those methods that I described. And the things that I can, the, the list of things are, well, the key type of that try map. So this is the rather satisfyingly nice type for lookup list. So um, this all, uh, one TM is missing in the middle block. Oh, uh, oh yes, quite right. Yes, thank you. On this slide, to be TM of list map of TM and V. So there's a, yes, uh, thank you. Ah, okay. So uh, I, all I want to say about this is everything works out as you would expect. 
in that case, but it's a nice illustration of the power of type classes to support abstraction. A yet another, you know, like uh, the million and one example of type classes and associated types working very smoothly for us. All right, uh, let me um, move towards wrapping up. Um, there is actually quite a lot more to say. This, there, there's a paper here. Here's the um, URL for it. We submitted it to Popple, where it will certainly be rejected. We didn't get. We got uh, reviews that said, "Well, this is really a programming pearl, isn't it? That suitable for Popple?" Which is actually not an unreasonable sort of review to get. Um, so, uh, but it, the paper is up on my homepage, and I think it's a. Um, uh, and it has. There's quite a lot to say. In fact, I think we'll we'll end we'll end up doing something else with it. Um, but uh, just to you know, encourage everybody else. It's fine to be rejected by Popple. It's a badge of honor, I think. Um, things that I have not mentioned in this talk that are covered in the paper is singleton maps. And um, so that is if you've got a uh, you know, relatively large expression, but it's the only one in its part of the space, right? you don't want to turn that into a deeply nested chi map. You might as well represent it all at once. But the, this is an example of something that's called path compression in the world of tries. And actually, I don't know how to do path compression for inner parts of the tree um, in this style. And I would um, love to... Um, uh, love somebody to figure that out. I I couldn't figure out a way to do it elegantly, so I throw it as a challenge. Right, something I don't know how to do. Um, also in the paper, you'll see that we need to. I remarked earlier that we have to generalize. I have to generalize from union to union with, and you'll find for insert. I can't just write insert. I have to generalize it to alter. Um, alter as in you know the containers version of alter. So there's code for all of that. There's um, some bits about unification. I think we don't have a very satisfying solution here. Um, uh, if you want to find all things that unify, um, which really we do, my our story is really we'll find all the things that match and then um, and then sort of knock out the ones that don't unify or find be, find all the ones that might unify, but not do a full on unification, then filter them out later. I don't I couldn't find an elegant way of doing it on the fly. Maybe somebody else can. The paper also gets some performance numbers and tells you lots about related work. So it's quite a lot more. To say it was a it's sort of it's an interesting nothing very deep but quite rich and quite a lot to say and I think undervalued I um uh, I'm pleased to see Raoul saying I'm so convinced to try maps so I'll apply them to all my problems um so yes that's that's my hope is that I've just given you an idea that you can find useful in other um, settings and here's my sort of uh, solutions like uh, conclusion slide by the way um, this is already used in GHC for uh, expressions and and types with this De Bruyne renumbering thing but we do not yet use it in GHC for instance lookup or rule lookup it's just a, um, it's kind of quotes just a piece of engineering to do but it was it's a piece of engineering that will always involve things like well done it doesn't speed things up at all or even slows things down and so it'll be it, there'll be there's work to do and I'd be very happy to uh, volunteer do it. 